morning, I'm really grateful for that. It's icy out there again a little bit, so be careful if you walk around, especially with kids around on the grass, that's where a lot of the ice was. I kind of like slipped a little bit again this morning, but I like it cold, so I'm not upset about that. My car was frozen. Uh, a few announcements for us. Uh, number one, like always, bathrooms are through the single door. Uh, on your left, if you go through there, beyond the bathrooms through the single door, is also a quiet room for babies if you find that you need that throughout the service. Um, and then through the double doors during the message is for walking age kiddos, if you'd like them supervised during the message today. Um, we have a team back there that will be watching those kids, hanging out with them, um, so you can send them back there during that time. And uh, coming up for our youth, if you have middle school or high school students, we have spring overnight trips that are coming up. Um, I'm pulling up the dates here so I can make sure I get them right. Uh, spring overnight trip to Shingletown that are coming up. So there's going to be a girls trip, high school and middle school, and then there'll be a guys trip, high school and middle school. Uh, and those trips are March 8th and 9th uh, for the girls, and April 12th and 13th for the guys. It's free to go, it's a little over 24 hour trip, lots of fun discussions in nature. So if you've got a middle school or high school you're interested in that, you can talk to me or email me or anything like that. Uh, and that's all for announcements. <coughs> Um, today we're starting a series in the Psalms. Um, it's one of the most popular books in the Bible. It's uh, one of my favorite books in the Bible to read through. Um, and I thought a really good way to kind of open us up into going into worship this morning would actually be to read one of the Psalms of Ascent as a unified prayer together. Because the Psalms kind of function as a songbook and prayer book that you get to hear more about. Um, but one thing that I've benefited greatly from in this past year is learning to use guided prayer. Um, it's relying on the prayers that have been written by others uh, for the purpose of getting you into a good space with God, getting you into the right mindset to approach God, to worship God together. And so what I'm going to ask everybody to do, the summer reading is 121. I'm just going to ask everybody, bow your heads, close your eyes as I read this as our guided prayer this morning, and then we'll worship together. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Amen.
both did. We each gave each other a hug. And Mr. McDonald, I didn't know this kid. So we ended up having McFlurries together and just sharing really briefly. But we had this common language. Like when someone is speaking your accent and they're saying like, dude, what? <laughs> totally. You're like, I know where you're from. I can relate. And no, I don't serve. People from Chico or Reading do not serve. When we moved to Washington, everyone asked, you're from California, do you serve? No, I do not. I've never touched a surfboard in my life. But a common language, something that you recognize. Bill Martin and I were having uh, lunch the other day, and uh, he, was, he was asking, have, have you seen Reacher? I was like, Jack Reacher? Dude, let me tell you, the new guy they cast is so much better than Tom Cruise. And then we got into this, this little thing. And, and as we were talking movies, there's something about when two people are conversing and they're using the same kind of language, whether you are talking about sports, whether you're talking about academics, whether you're talking about a hobby or an interest, when you share with someone a common language, it sparks something inside of you. You feel understood. You feel known. And the Psalms are that for us. Poetry and theology. There's frustration and praise. There's judgment and forgiveness. There's something in each one of them with which we connect. And there are words. There are thoughts. There are expression. There are common language which we recognize. Even our vulgar language. They include the whole human experience. So help me out here. If I was to say, like, the Lord is my shepherd, you would say, I shall be good. Like, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a very good. Taste and see that the excellent. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul is free. Good. Be still and know. Oh, see, you guys know your psalm. What about Psalm 58? Break the teeth of the wicked. <laughs> And may they be like a slug that melts as they move along. Oh, that's one of my favorites. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. And we're actually going to devote a whole morning to those types of songs. But we need those. We need that common language because they reflect humanity's way of crying out for justice. We have to have that in our life. So the book of Psalms has 150 different psalms in the whole collection. And they're one of the few psalms, or excuse me, one of the few books that are used in both Christian and Jewish worship. And it is perhaps the most widely used book in the entire Bible. And it's actually five books, divided into five categories and sections. And they were actually written over the course of 1,000 years. Moses writing psalms, Asaph, sons of Korah, Solomon, David. David has only written actually less than half of the psalms that we have. And the psalms are sometimes called the Bible within the Bible because they tell the, the story of all the major themes, from sin to redemption. And Jesus himself quotes the psalms more than any other book. And the categories of psalms, are thanksgiving ones, uh, wisdom psalms that talk about uh, ideological things with which we can order our lives around, lament psalms. Becky is going to be talking about why lament should be such a big part of the believer's life. Royal psalms talking about uh, God blessing the king, protecting the king, trust psalms, praise psalms. Prophecy Psalms, you did not let your anointed one see decay. Uh, pilgrimage Psalms, which we're going to look at today. Imprecatory Psalms, those are the cursing Psalms. I actually did that one because I, I thought, that's right, <laughs> right in my uh, wheelhouse. Liturgical Temple Hymns. And so we're going to study six of these. And why study the Psalms? Because they give us a voice. They help us to express every feeling and every frustration common to mankind. They give us words when words seem distant. They give us a pathway to speak to God from the depths of our soul. So this first week, 
Ascension Psalm. Psalms of Ascent, pilgrimage psalms. This is where traveling worshipers would sing these psalms as they made their way to Jerusalem three times a year. Remember in the Old Testament law, God set aside three times where, when people were to pilgrimage to Jerusalem. One was to celebrate the Feast of Passover, when God passed over the Israelites and brought judgment upon the, the gods of Egypt and the Egyptians themselves. And then the Feast of Booths, where they remembered that they were sojourners in Egypt and they lived in tents for many years. And then there's the Feast of Pentecost, when God descended upon Mount Sinai and His Spirit dwelled with His people. So those three times they would go to Jerusalem and they would ascend up this mountainous terrain to Jerusalem, which sits at 2,700 feet. So it's kind of like uh, uh, my mom's house in Shingle Town, about that exact same elevation. And when they got to Jerusalem, they would actually climb a series of steps. They would enter in the southern side of the city. And here's actually a picture right here at the bottom. And they would make their way all the way. Wow, look at that. It's a little green boat going up to the temple. And as they would ascend these steps, they would recite and sing these psalms of ascent, these pilgrimage psalms. And each of the psalms between Psalm 120 and 134 is called at the beginning of the psalm a psalm of ascent. And the Hebrew term for ascent means going up. So why did the people of God need you? And why do we? I was talking with Lori Cole this morning. I asked her per permission. Uh, she is going to embark on a very famous pilgrimage to the Grand Canyon and do the Rim to Rim Trail, where it's uh, it's like 24 or 25 miles. You climb down, you spend the night, and then you climb out of the Grand Canyon. And John was assuring me, oh, it's it's level. You're not going straight up. I've seen some of these pictures. Um, it's absolutely breathtaking. You have a picture of it? Oh, look at that. Epic. Now imagine if Lori was to go in a couple months and she thought, you know what? I don't need to bring any gear. I'm just going to pack a 16-ounce water bottle, um, you know, little crystal guys who ones, and I'm just going to head down in my women's shoes. And, but we think that was foolish. In order to do the rent to rim trail on the Grand Canyon, you have to have the correct equipment, you have to have the, the correct uh, snacks and food and energy bars, and you've got to prepare. You've got to physically and mentally prepare for this type of excursion because you're starting at like 9,000 feet and then you're coming up to the other side, which is like 7,000 feet. It's, it's quite an extensive and exhausting journey. So preparation is key for any kind of meeting or moment or event. And the reason God gives his people in their pilgrimage opportunities to meditate on truths is because he knows they need time to, to prepare, to meet with him, to pray. Like the meeting with God requires preparation. And so there are verses, there are paragraphs, there are songs that help center the heart to prepare to meet with God. So the psalm we are going to look at is smack dab in the middle of these psalms of ascent. And it is Psalm 131. David wrote this one. And he wrote this. Psalm for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not hot. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome to be too great. You see what he's already doing right now is he's putting life into perspective. Because going up to Jerusalem where God was for him was to put things in a right order. God is master of the universe. God is in control of the world. He's in control of my life. Therefore, because of this reality, David is able to say, I'm not in 
control. I don't have to be proud or haughty because I actually see how little control I actually have. I'm not going to concern myself with things that are too great for me, that are beyond my scope, that are beyond my control, too awesome for me to grasp. And he says, instead, I have calmed and quieted myself. Like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within it. He's able to find a place of contentedness. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, now and always. So on a pilgrimage, people would be reciting this as they're walking up to Jerusalem. My heart is not proud. I'm not in control. I'm not the center of the universe. God is. Rather, my heart is humble. My heart is contrite. I recognize where I am in the pecking order. I'm like a child that is content. I love how he ends this. Israel, my nation, my family, my people. Put your hope in the Lord. Not in me. He would write this as the king of his people. Oh, that my people would put their hope in me, that they would put their faith in me. No. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Now and always. What a great preparatory prayer. When one is about to meet with God at the temple. As one is about to pray. The psalm of preparation. Going back to Scotland, when we were touring around Edinburgh in uh, 2005, one of our hosts took us up to a hill to see the style of Edinburgh. And on top of Carlton Hill, there's this um, thing. And we looked at it and we said, that looks like part of the park, you know, the like Acropolis in Greece. And the person said, yeah, that's Scotland's disgrace. And we said, what? He said, well, that's what it's called. This was built during the Napoleonic Wars and was meant to be a memorial to all the people who lost their lives fighting the French uh, during the reign of uh, Napoleon. And we said, Is it, was it supposed to be bigger? He said, oh yeah, it's supposed to be a whole thing. It's supposed to look like a Parthenon. But the man who went to the government for money didn't realize how much it was going to cost and was only able to complete this much of it. And it reminded me of that parable that Jesus tells. If a man's going to build a tower, is he going to set out all his finances and look ahead of time? Is he able to finish what he's going to build? Preparation. Jesus told that parable talking about if a man was going to follow after him. The cost of discipleship. When we look at that and all the locals, you can actually Google the uh, Edinburgh's shame or the disgrace of Scotland. And you will see this image pop up. And this is a reminder of faulty preparation. When we engage with God, it's an interesting thing because we are, as believers who are under a new covenant in Christ, we so often come to God in such a cavalier fashion. We come to God without the respect and the awe that he deserves. Because we tend to think of God as chummy older brother. And we have to remember that even though we are brought into family, this is still the creator of the universe. And when one goes to the creator of the universe to converse and pray, it's a serious matter. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this in chapter 5, verse 2. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. This is a great reminder. We need this reminder because we live in a very idolized society in America where we are the ones who are always... You know, 
the center of our own universe, have to be reminded of who we are. We are beloved children of God who are not the center of the universe. We are a part of a family where God gets the honor, God gets the praise. Um, when my wife and I were doing uh, premarital counseling, we, we thought we were pretty um, responsible, aware. Um, we just thought each, each you know, like, I thought she's, she's pretty much perfect, and she thought I was pretty much perfect. <laughs> and we had no idea what we were getting into. The, the people who say they're going to go into a marriage relationship without any preparation are stupid. Absolutely <laughs> stupid. Because, and I mean that, like, if you did that, well, you were. I know. <laughs> and here's why. Because we sat in for our first premarital meeting, and we were talking about uh, how we view each other. Are you viewing each other accurately? Do you see the other person in a way that actually reflects who they are? So, the guy, the gentleman who was doing our premarital said, um, okay, here's a scale of one to 10. How joyful uh, are they and how joyful are you on this? Let's just, you know, he used joy as an example. I said, well, oh, okay, one to 10. I'm gonna put myself at five or put myself in the middle. I'm like medium joy, Becky's at a 10. She's all joy. Like if you've met her, you know, you get that. And Becky decided to put herself in the middle at five and she put me up at one. <laughs> <laughs> Joyless. <laughs> Laughing. And so we flipped them around, we showed them to each other, and I'm like, you see me that way? I'm normal. You're extra joyful. And she said, no, I'm normal. I'm average. You're, you're depressed. You're depressed. <laughs> and then suddenly we're crying, and then after the meeting, we're like, should we even be married? <laughs> So I've discovered in the last 18 years that we've been married, I was right. I am a five, and she is a 10. <laughs> this is true. So people have know that. And she's come to admit, yes, she's a little, she leans more on the positive side. I do lean a little bit more on the critical side. But that preparation was so important for us so that we could learn to fight fair, so that we could learn to forgive, so that we could learn to actively listen, why would we think that in our relationship with God, it would need no preparation on our own? If marriage is capable, so that we can work on ourselves, so that we can see things clearly, so we can see ourselves clearly, if that's needed in this kind of relationship, why would we think that our relationship with God wouldn't need even more preparation, so that we are aware as we are bringing ourselves to Him? The Psalms of the set are Psalms of preparation, preparing to meet with God, who loves to be fully present with his people, and to be able to give him an offering of ourselves that costs us something. Why is this important? Why is preparation to meet with God important? Isn't God just super accessible that we can talk to whenever we want? I mean, we are told in Hebrews 4, that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. And somehow, there is this crazy confluence of Ecclesiastes and Hebrews that's saying, don't be quick with your mouth. Remember, God's in heaven, you're on earth, let the words be few, and come boldly. Somehow, these are both true at the same time of our relationship with God. We approach with care and with confidence. We have confidence, but with the respect and honor and awe that is due God, without shame. This allows us to pray from an honest place, an awareness of self. Preparation allows us time to process life about our relationship with God. Preparation uh, allows us margin. We talk about these at our spiritual uh, renewal retreats uh, that we go to up in Shingletown regularly. How, how hard it is to connect with God when we are busy, but how margin actually creates space for us to actively listen to God. 
In these times of ascent, preparation allow us to remember what God has done for us. How often do we stop, stop to remember the things God has done, the testimonies we can recount of every time God has intercepted our life? Or are our lives too busy to remember, too busy to recount? I think one of the most beautiful aspects of preparation, especially when we see these people ascending together, is the communal aspect. Doing this as a tribe of people. Doing this as a, a clan or as a family. That we get to meet with God together. In our preparation, we can prepare with each other to meet with God. To help each other process. Where are you? Where is your soul? The Psalms of Ascent allow us the time to be aware of the posture of our heart, to be aware of the state of our soul, to ask, what am I thinking of now? How am I coming to this present moment? This present moment is a sacred moment if we allow it. Recognizing, do I have anxiety? What are my fears right now? What are my sorrows? What are my joys? Am I bringing this to God? Recognizing that all I'm feeling, all I'm going through, all I'm dealing with has a resting place in God. Will I allow Him to meet me there in the honesty and the brokenness? So we're going to go through Psalm 131 once more as a response, as a preparatory response that we get to do in a communal way as a church family. And we're going to go through this just very slow and allow us to reflect on the state of our souls and ask those questions. What am I bringing in here and here? What am I bringing to this present moment? So let's pray this as a way of preparation, as a way of active listening to God. Psalm 131, a psalm for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not hot. I don't concern myself with matters too great are too awesome for me to grasp. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for its mother's milk. Yes, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, Israel, people of God, Put your hope in the Lord, now and always. Sit in that prayer for a moment. Listen to your heart, listen to your thoughts. <coughs> what are you bringing before God right now? What is the state of your soul? God is your Father, the Creator of all. He who orders the chaos and yet cares for you and wants to be involved in your life and your growth, our redemption. Just formulate a prayer to Him that allows you to cast all of who you are upon all of who you is.
Father, we say our hearts are not proud and our eyes are not haughty. We don't concern ourselves with things that are too great or awesome for us to grasp. We recognize that you are in control. That you are God over all. And whatever you purpose on the earth and above the earth and the heavens will come to pass. Nothing can thwart your sovereignty and your mastery over all creation. We just want to say that and recognize you really are in control and we do trust you. We trust you with our lives, with our hearts, with our futures, with our families, with the hard situations in which we find ourselves. All of our life is in your hands. And so we content ourselves in trust. Because we trust that you're good. And you're working out a good plan for each one of us. You're weaving us into a tapestry that will tell a beautiful story. Thank you for bringing us into your family and allowing us to be a part of it of this redemption story. We are so thankful. Jesus, in your name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand and respond to our God's name.